Um, I'd like to welcome you to the three-minute thesis final at Swansea University. Uh, my name is Professor Gerd Aarts and I'm the Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Postgraduate Research here at Swansea. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to this final. Uh, the research carried out by our postgraduate community is of extreme importance to us and to the outside world as we explore new questions and find innovative solutions to challenging problems. However, doing the research is only one side of the coin. It's equally important to be able to present your research to your colleagues, or academics, future employers, and also lay people in clear and understandable terms in order to make the widest impact. And this is where Three Minutes Thesis or 3MT comes in. 3MT is an international competition which originated at the University of Queensland in Australia and now takes place um, at over 900 universities across the world. In a presentation no longer than three minutes, you are asked to explain your research in a way that is accessible to a non-specialist audience, using only a single slide as backup. Uh, the first round at Swansea has now been completed and a judging panel consisting of Chris Alton, Professor in Physics and Director of Oil Science, Carolyn Rauter, Scholarly Communications Officer, and Rian Morris, Chair of the Public Engagement Forum. And this panel has selected 19 researchers to progress to the final. In the following hour, you will be able to hear and see these 19 finalists using the recordings made by each of them. From these finalists then, a winner and three runners-up have been selected by the directors of postgraduate research from each of Swansea University's academic colleges. And I have the honor to announce the winner and the runners-up at the end of this hour. So please, without further ado, let's enjoy the presentation and I will see you again on the other side. Well, if you do not speak Mandarin, you may not have a clue about what I just said. Imagine that we have on-site interpreter, the problem is solved. But before the interpreter is qualified to do the job, how can he or she be well trained? One element is the learning environment, student-centered environment, which means that students explore knowledge largely by themselves, rather than passively receive knowledge from teachers, is supported by many interpreting scholars in recent years. But some real interpreting classroom experiments indicate that student-centered environment is not always effective, with student interpreters mourning about getting half the result with twice the time. So, what's wrong? Some theorists propose that different learning environments suit the acquisition of different kinds of knowledge differently. So the student-centered environment may not suit the learning of all kinds of interpreting knowledge. Besides, several studies show that learning environment types can affect the performance of students with different learning ability types, which means that student-centered environments may neither suit every interpreting student when their learning ability varies. In my research, I intend to find the intricate relations among the three. Learning environment, interpreting knowledge, and learning ability types by tracking student interpreters' performance in real interpreting training sessions. Based on future results, I very much expect that my research can provide a targeted and effective training method for future interpreters. Researching such topic is very important because interpreters are the language barrier breakers. I dare to say, today's human society cannot function properly without them. From the international organization's aid project in developing worlds to the recent multinational cooperation in developing COVID-19 vaccines and treatments and so many others, interpreters break the language barrier to help people communicate and cooperate for a better future. But beforehand, becoming a qualified interpreter is laborious. Working hard but a little result is not that unusual. Finding an effective training method can enable more future language barrier breakers to help the world continuously build a cooperative and communicative community. Oh, by the way, my opening sentence in Mandarin means, thanks for listening.
Have you ever wondered how Facebook knows which friends to recommend you? Maybe you think you know the answer to this question. Maybe it's about the mutual friends that you have with other people. But surely at some point you've been surprised to see that Facebook recommended you someone you didn't have very many mutual friends with. Of course, Facebook used many different techniques, but one approach to social network analysis that you may not be aware of is the use of community finding algorithms. These algorithms can cluster people according to their friendships and connections without any information about the individuals themselves, not their names, ages, interests, or anything else. But how is this possible? Let's take a look at my slide. In these networks, each point represents an individual and the lines show their friendships. Even though I've told you nothing about community finding algorithms, you might still have some idea about how to group the people in network one into communities. However, when we move to network two, it becomes a bit harder for us humans to see any sort of pattern, but the community finding algorithms still work. This is where my research comes in. My aim is to provide explanations for the communities that are found by the algorithms. And I do this by the analysis of features in the network using machine learning. These features might include things like, how many friends does person A have? How many friends do their friends have? And how many degrees of separation are there between person A and person B? These are just examples from a long list. But as I explained, they require no information about the individuals, just their friendships and connections. Ultimately, this analysis could be used to design a visual tool that will enable other researchers to explore the communities in networks from their research. But who are these researchers? Who really cares about the recommendations that you get on social media? Well, maybe not you. But what if one of your friends is clinically depressed and they keep being recommended connections with people who post images of self-harm? What if your child is being recommended connections with people who depict alcohol misuse online? My work could potentially help public health researchers explore the spread of self-harm and alcohol misuse on Instagram. Using findings from the analysis of communities in their networks, they would be able to design interventions to help stop the spread of self-harm and alcohol misuse in young people. Thank you. Much like any modern army, the immune system is a powerful, dynamic and multifaceted force. In a perilous world with scarce resources, the immune system must identify foreign and native threats amid a panoply of signals. But what does the immune system consider a threat? Take, for example, a foreign organism implanting into your tissue, taking nutrients and oxygen from your blood. Surely this is a threat. Well, this is a description of pregnancy, albeit a crude one. Now, one logically asks the question, why aren't all pregnancies terminated by an immune response? A well-regulated force with proper oversight prevents this from occurring. In our bodies, a particular kind of immune cell, called a regulatory T cell, has a key role in this regard. Regulatory T cells reduce inflammation and prevent inappropriate immune responses. For regulatory T cells to carry out these functions properly, they must be provided with the correct nutrients. Just like you or I may become lethargic or animated, depending on what we eat, so too do the functions of our immune cells depend on the fats, sugars, and amino acids they eat. When immune cells aren't getting the right kinds of foods, such as in obesity, they may step out of line, causing pregnancy complications, including preeclampsia. The dangers of obesity have recently been brought into sharp focus by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, where this obesity has been highlighted as a severe risk factor in the severity of the disease. Using blood donations from pregnant and non-pregnant women, I'm exploring the hypothesis that the functions of regulatory T cells in pregnancy are dependent on metabolism and changes in metabolism caused by obesity impair maternal immune function. Examining what different molecules are expressed on the surface of immune cells, including regulatory T cells, 
I've begun to build a picture of pregnancy-specific changes, noting fewer molecules associated with potentially dangerous or aggressive responses. Further work will take advantage of new technologies, allowing unparalleled scrutiny of cells on a one-by-one -one basis, underscoring how these cells change in pregnancy and the effect the mother's dress size might have. Beyond improving outcomes in pregnancy and empowering women to make informed decisions about the effects of obesity on their reproductive health, understanding the natural adaptations required for a successful pregnancy will reveal new ways of treating immune-mediated diseases from autoimmunity to cancer. Thank you very much. Extremely challenging, stretch to breaking point, a period of extreme healthcare resource pressure have been some of the news headlines over the past couple of months during the COVID-19 pandemic. But even before this, healthcare services were experiencing increasing pressures on their limited resources. One area of healthcare, particularly feeling this pressure within Wales, was in services for people affected by cancer. This is because it's now estimated that one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in our lives within Wales. A champion of sorts was thought to have been found in the form of value-based healthcare. This way of working encourages healthcare services to focus on improving the value of the services that they deliver. But what do we mean by value? Does value mean the same to all of us? And whose values are we talking about? Let me put it to you this way. When I go to the cinema with my friends, we all buy different snacks for the movie. The point being, each of us values something different about the movie going experience. So you'd have to involve each of us in the process of developing a definition of value in terms of the movie going experience. And this is what my thesis is looking to tackle for cancer care services. I have identified the key healthcare stakeholders to involve in this discussion of value. I have identified the key healthcare stakeholders to include patients, carers, healthcare professionals and members of the public. I'm currently in the process of interviewing these key healthcare stakeholders to develop an understanding of how the different groups view value. Based upon my interview findings, I will develop a clear definition of value from the different perspectives. I will also explore the similarities and the differences between the different perspectives. Based upon this understanding, I will develop a robust characterization of value that incorporates the different perspectives. It is my hope to ensure that value is a concept that has a shared understanding amongst healthcare decision makers, healthcare professionals and healthcare service users like you. Ultimately, this will be able to be used to ensure that cancer care services are delivering the value that is expected by its stakeholders. Did you know that if you put a magnet in a hot enough oven, it will lose its magnetization? This is just one instance of what's known as a phase transition, along with more familiar examples like the freezing or evaporation of water. Now, physics does a great job of explaining why this happens to the magnet, but I want to know how this happens. What drives this change? What exact temperature does the oven need to be? Topological data analysis is a new field of mathematics which leverages ideas and tools from geometry in order to analyse data. The premise is simple. Shape matters. It allows us to make quantitative measurements of the connectivity of a data set. For example, how it might cluster into groups or form circles. Take a look at the left image. This was produced by taking a special X-ray of a magnet. The lines and arrows show us the internal magnetic field and the behavior of these determines how magnetically strong the entire magnet is. It's immediately clear to us that circular structures 
are playing a pretty big role here. The idea behind my work then is to take these tools from topological data analysis and use them to study the phase transition undergone by magnets in the oven. Now, at this point, you might be imagining me putting on my oven gloves and thinking, how on earth does that work? But rather than studying real magnets, like the image on the left, I study mathematical models of magnets, like the image on the right. A helpful bit of physics called universality tells us that certain properties of a phase transition we see in the model will exactly reflect what goes on in the real world. By writing code, I've simulated a simplified version of what the inside of a magnet might look like at different temperatures. This is what gives me the data to analyze and allows me to see how increasing the temperature leads to interesting geometric changes which drive the phase transition. We can almost literally see how the magnet loses its magnetization in a brand new light. The aim going forward is to develop this approach so that we can extract a precise estimate of the transition temperature, as well as other properties of interest to physicists. So that's my research, but it's not the whole story. You see, we're not all that interested in magnets. The hope is by developing this approach in this relatively straightforward case, it will later be able to offer us insights into phase transitions at the very forefront of physics, the world of quantum and the kind of transitions that only go on in the center of stars. The possibilities for future work are many, and at least to me, very exciting. Thank you. Pregnancy, the most natural phenomena that a large proportion of the world's population will experience at some point in their lives, often more than once. Much effort has gone into understanding pregnancy and why it sometimes goes wrong, yet still many women and their babies succumb to poor pregnancy outcomes. The risk of many of these outcomes, such as spontaneous miscarriage, preeclampsia, a pregnancy condition signaled by high blood pressure, and gestational diabetes are all increased when the mother is obese. Like obesity in general, maternal obesity is increasing. In the UK, more than half of women are overweight or obese at the start of pregnancy. We don't really know why obesity in pregnancy can cause poorer outcomes, but obesity in the general population is associated with a chronic low level of inflammation due to the release of molecules from fat tissue. This can affect the function of many other cells and tissues in the body, including the immune system, which plays a vital role in sustaining a healthy pregnancy and so any disruption to this can lead to undesired responses. One example in pregnancy is the placenta, the organ linking mother to baby, and it is full of important immune cells, such as macrophages, which play a role in placental development and maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Macrophages are present not only in the placenta, but in all of our tissues. They can be pro-inflammatory, for example, in response to bacterial or viral infection, or anti-inflammatory and help repair tissue damage if it occurs. Keeping this balance between the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory function of macrophages in the placenta is very important and we think that this is disrupted in pregnancies of obese women. We already know that the placenta in obese pregnancies is more inflammatory and we are starting to really understand that the immune system and function of these cells such as macrophages is sensitive to our diet. Nutritional imbalances such as too much sugar and too much fat that occur in obesity can disrupt the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory function of macrophages. We have all heard the saying, you are what you eat. Well, this applies to immune cells such as macrophages too. My research aim is to understand if the higher levels of fats and sugars that occur in obese pregnancies change the way that macrophages in the placenta function. I will do this by isolating macrophages from the placenta of healthy weight and obese pregnant women and analyze differences in their function and how they use fats and sugars. These results will help identify why pregnant, obese pregnant women have problems and hopefully develop better ways to prevent these problems.
Are you ready? We will jump into the future. It's early morning, you try to wake up and you are in your 60s. Who is this person near me? I don't know. What? You can't recognize your husband or your wife? Weird. Or same scenario, you try to wake up, but oh my God, it's so heavy to get up. And the more I try, the more I tremble. Well, unfortunately, you'll have one of the two most widespread neurodegenerative diseases that affect older people, Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease. The symptoms of those two diseases are due to the loss of specific cells in specific area of your brain. Why do you have these losses? <laughs> well, we don't know. And that's why we don't have a effective treatment nor a specific diagnosis. However, we seem to see the light at the end of the tunnel because thanks to the tireless effort of scientists, a novel association between the levels in blood and the fluid that surrounds your brain, the CSF, fat, and the development of neurodegenerative diseases rise. What I'm trying to do with my PhD is to clarify if there is a, a relationship and what is the contribution of fat to the, to the development of neurodegenerative diseases. I'm doing this by the combination of two different techniques. Liquid chromatography, thanks to I identify the fat into blood and CSF of Parkinson and Alzheimer patients, and the mass spectrometry, thanks to I quantify the levels of these fats. And I must tell you, I spent six months just to set up the method, and then I moved on to the Alzheimer pa patients. I have very promising results, but I still have to do more experiments. But trust me, remain on these screens because in the nearest future we will have finally clarified the contribution of fat to the development of the neurodegenerative diseases and at the end be diagnosed by one of the two will be as easy as doing a quick blood test and we will have a specific and effective treatment to defeat those diseases. Thank you so much for the attention. Psychology has historically tried to fix what's wrong with people and has assumed that reducing impairment is the same as improving someone's well-being. But imagine you were diagnosed with a chronic physical or mental health disorder, the effects of which cannot be reversed. Is there no opportunity for you to experience well-being because you have to live with some degree of impairment? Our research group argues that that isn't the case. We have developed a holistic model of well-being, which summarises into five key components. Balanced minds, healthy bodies, meaningful relationships, connection to nature, and positive change. I am proud to be an assistant psychologist. I work with individuals who've experienced acquired brain injury. They experience permanent physical, psychological, and social difficulties, which turn their whole lives around. Our NHS service has designed a range of wellbeing interventions based on these five components of wellbeing. And we've done this by partnering up with community projects like Down to Earth's Nature-Based Rehabilitation and Surf Abilities Adapted Surf Lessons. So what have our service users said about these interventions? One said it was his life saver. Another said it made him feel wanted again. Now, the problem with measuring well-being is that we're often relying on people's subjective opinion. But what if we could accompany that qualitative feedback with the body's physiological response? We propose that these five components of well-being 
have one common mechanism through which they impact well-being, and that is the vagus nerve, which connects the brain to the rest of the body. Now, the vagus nerve can be measured using heart rate variability, or HRV, which is the time interval between each heartbeat. My next step as a researcher is to continue to evaluate these fantastic interventions using HRV technology. We hope to demonstrate that our fantastic qualitative feedback aligns with the body's physical response. And we hope to show that there is such a need for the use of these holistic well-being interventions, which build on these five components of well-being and to demonstrate that each and every one of us is capable of improving our lives and our well-being, regardless of limitations or disability. So, you use the toilet, you flush the chain. You don't give a second thought to where your waste goes. But not everyone in the world has access to sewage sanitation. In fact, 2.3 billion people don't. In developing countries such as India, there are pit latrines. So what happens to this waste? Well, it's dumped untreated into the environment. It causes river pollution and contaminates fresh water supplies. Contaminated drinking water and poor sanitation cause 800,000 deaths every year. So what are we doing about this? Well, one method of safely treating faecal sludge is to heat it to high temperatures in the absence of oxygen. And this creates a carbon rich product called biochar. It's kind of like posh charcoal. Now, biochar is recalcitrant and that means it doesn't degrade very easily. So carbon that would otherwise be lost to the atmosphere as CO2 is stored safely within the biochar. And this can help us mitigate climate change. The biochar is also free of all pathogens and can be used as a soil amendment. So for my research, I've studied faecal sludge biochar from India. The first thing I found was that it has a high ash content. This means it's full of lovely minerals and nutrients beneficial to plants. It also has a unique structure. It's kind of like a hard sponge. So it has these pores, which provide ideal habitats for microbes that improve soil quality. It also has a high pH, and this high alkalinity is really beneficial to growing crops in acidic soil. For the next part of my research, I looked at growing tomatoes in an acidic, low nutrient soil, or as the farmer described it, really crappy soil. And this soil has similar properties to soils found in India. So I used four different treatments, soil on its own, soil plus biochar, soil plus fertilizer, and soil plus biochar and fertilizer. The first thing I found was that biochar, when compared to soil alone, produced plants that were taller, produced a far greater quantity of tomatoes, and the tomatoes weighed a lot more. Finally, the soil, biochar and fertiliser treatment produce a tomato yield 33 times greater than the yield of the plants grown in just soil alone, which is pretty staggering. So next time you use the toilet, I hope you take a second to think about my research and how we can reuse and recycle our waste better in the future. Bert your hands up if you have a brain. Now imagine your brain started to attack itself. A war is raging inside your skull and you don't know why it's happening or how to stop it. In a nutshell, this is multiple sclerosis or MS. We all have billions of nerves in our brain busy sending and receiving signals from the rest of our body. Normally, they're covered in a protective fatty layer called myelin. Picture an electrical wire. The internal metal wire transports the electric signal, whilst the plastic outer coating surrounds and insulates it. In the case of nerves, the axon, or the metal wire, transports the signals, and the myelin acts as that protective coating. MS affects more than 2.3 million people worldwide. In MS, the body attacks itself.
Immune cells in the brain start feasting away at the myelin sheath, resulting in loss of movement, problems with eyesight and depression. I am trying to understand what might be going awry in the brains of people with MS. And to do this, I use donated brain tissue from people who did and did not live with the disease. I dissect the part of the brain I'm interested in and then I mash it up so it can be run through an instrument called a mass spectrometer. This is able to separate invisible compounds in the sample by their weight, measures them and then provides a visual graph. The compounds I'm interested in are called oxysterols. So why am I interested in oxysterols? Oxysterols are made from cholesterol. Cholesterol is found in that protective layer around nerves, the myelin sheath. Other scientists have shown that statins, cholesterol lowering drugs, might be helpful for people with long standing MS. So to recap, myelin contains cholesterol, cholesterol makes oxysterols, and statins lower cholesterol and might be helpful in MS. You might be thinking that lowering cholesterol in MS with statins is bizarre because we need cholesterol for a healthy brain and people with MS already have less cholesterol because they have less myelin and you'd be right. So I actually think that statins are affecting the oxysterols so I'm investigating their role in MS. I have found that oxysterols differ in the brains of people who did and did not live with MS this is hugely exciting. It means that we might be able to make new drugs to help people who currently have no treatment available. It is my hope that we are slowly getting closer to defeating the raging brain war that is multiple sclerosis. Imagine you were losing your sight. The world around you has become dark, dull or simply unrecognisable. You were unable to recognise friends and loved ones and ultimately unable to live your life in the same way. How do you feel? How do you interact socially with others when you can't see them? Do you see yourself as being disabled? Would you even tell other people you've lost your sight? This is the reality for over 2 million people in the UK living with sight loss and this number is likely to increase given the current alien population. Research has shown that sight loss is recognised as a major and extremely stressful life event with many negative psychological consequences for well-being, social interaction and identity. However, much of the existing research into the psychology of sight loss tends to focus on one single aspect such as only looking at the impact of emotions or social interaction. This is where my research comes in. My research takes the view that sight loss and its consequences should be explored as an entire personal experience. Therefore, I conducted interviews with 10 people who have recently experienced sight loss, asking them to discuss the effect of sight loss on many aspects of psychology rather than just one. My current results highlight two significant issues, disclosure of sight loss and identity following sight loss. When disclosing sight loss to others, there was a clear conflict between needing to share this with others to gain help and support versus wanting to remain private for fear of awkwardness or rejection. There was also a divide when it came to social preferences, with many participants wanting to still connect with other people who had also experienced sight loss versus others who actually felt segregated by their own impairment. Remember when I asked you whether you would see yourself as being disabled following losing your sight? All participants identified themselves as being disabled, although many viewed the term disability as a label placed on them by society. Taking this further, many saw their sight loss as an invisible disability, often feeling ignored or misunderstood by others. These findings clearly demonstrate a need for greater awareness of sight loss within psychology, but also more generally within everyday life. It is my hope that my research allows people with sight loss to be both seen and heard. While they may represent a statistic, they have a story, they have a voice. Above all, we cannot lose sight of sight loss. Thank you.
Hi, my name's Jess. I'm fine. I'm just probably Mobley. Which is a 19th century term used to describe the state of not being unwell, but not being well. It's here in the middle. And this is what we're aiming for as a society. For example, a lot of the NHS system aims to move people from a state of ill-being to here. And we're not pushing people towards well-being. I've created a model of well-being that will do this. And I've called this ICE. The I refers to factors on an individual level that impact well-being. The C refers to community and social aspects that impact well-being. And the E is the environment, which concerns a physical and psychological connection to nature. Research has been done in these areas, but in disciplinary silos. And as such, no model of well-being has ever combined all of this research together. And this is what my PhD will do. I've investigated the impact of these ICE domains on well-being during the pandemic. On an individual level, as an exemplar of health behaviours, I measured physical activity. And as exemplars of positive mental health, I measured gratitude and tragic optimism. On a community level, I measured social support. And on an environment level, I measured nature connection. I used a regression analysis to analyse my data. And what a regression does is it aims to investigate how well your predictive variables, in my case, the ice domains, can predict an outcome variable, in my case, well-being. Now, as a reference guide, in positive psychology, if we can predict up to 10 to 20% of someone's well-being, we are happy. That is good. Now, keeping that 10 to 20% in mind, my regression analysis with 123 people, whilst controlling for age, gender, and socioeconomic status, could predict up to 46% of well-being. 46%! And this is incredible because there are evidence-based strategies proven to build on these ice domains. So I ask you, should we be settling for a state of frobly mobly as a society? No! Take a look at my ice domains. Thank you for listening. About 800,000 people die from suicide every year. One thing we can do to prevent suicide is to identify individuals at risk and intervene. Now about 40% of individuals that die by suicide attend accident and emergency services in the year before they die. This represents a really important place where we can identify those individuals and intervene. So currently, if you attend accident emergency services with any suicidal thoughts, feelings or behaviours, you receive an assessment with a mental health practitioner. My PhD was comparing that current assessment process to our new assessment process called the ROSP. So currently, the assessment involves an unstructured exploration of the historical, social and psychological factors in the person's life. The problem with this is that humans are notoriously bad at integrating lots of different factors into one single coherent decision. We often prioritise unimportant information and we overlook really key issues. So our new risk assessment, the ROSP, tries to overcome this. The ROSP systematically guides uh, the clinicians through 20 key risk factors all associated with suicidal behaviour and gets them to bring them all together into one global evaluation of the patient, their risks and what needs to be done to keep them safe. So we compared if the ROSP was any better at predicting future suicidal behaviour compared to assessment as usual. When patients were referred for risk assessment, the mental health practitioner carried out the assessment as usual and I carried out the ROSP assessment. We then followed patients up three months later to see if they had engaged in any suicidal behaviour. So, to test if an assessment is any good at predicting an outcome, you need to see how often that assessment produces hits and how often it produces false alarms. In this context, a hit is when you say someone will engage in suicidal behaviour and they do, and a false alarm is when you say someone will engage in suicidal behaviour and they don't. So, if your analysis produces a number of one, that perfect line on the graph means you correctly predicted all instances of suicidal behaviour with no false alarms, which is great. Uh, if your assessment produced a number of 0 0.5, that random line on the graph 
It means you are no better at chance than predicting suicidal behaviour, and you may as well base your judgments off a coin toss. Um, so assessment as usual produced a number of 0 0.62, which is better than chance, but well short of perfect. The ROSP produced a number of 0 0.78, which is much better than chance and significantly better than assessment as usual. So in conclusion, our new risk assessment was better at identifying future suicidal behaviour compared to assessment as usual. If we can identify individuals at risk of suicide and intervene, we can make really important strides in preventing death from suicide. Thank you. Helen Keller is a fraud. She's a conspiracy theory. All that stuff they tell you about her in history class? That's fake news. She's a hoax. These are statements from a recent trend on the social media site TikTok, which took disabled historical figures like Helen Keller and tried to claim that they were fake. In the case of Helen, the people doing this attempted to erase her legacy as a famous American author, disability rights advocate, political activist, and lecturer. My research explores disability history in the 19th century, and examples such as these ones on TikTok are emblematic of why disability history matters. My work explores conditions of visibility, such as invisibility, partial visibility, and hypervisibility that disabled people have experienced and negotiated their identities within throughout the 19th century. During lockdown, my work has had to move online and outside of the traditional archival space. It is in these online spaces that we can see that disability history is dealing with multiple issues of visibility, not only historically and how the archive material has been managed, preserved and made accessible online, but also in how the subject has been neglected and overlooked by society at large, which has led to this recent spate of disability history inspired TikToks claiming that historical figures are conspiracy theories. The historical figures that I'm exploring have already had to navigate and negotiate their identity within their time period, but they're now having to do it in the present as well. Even when we have the writings of that person, their lived experience can still be erased. And a famous example of this is Florence Nightingale, who described herself as an incurable invalid. For her, there was no conflict in identifying as disabled and working as a nurse. But there is a conflict in how her story is told and how it is taught, because her disability has been made invisible and erased from her history, and yet as a historical figure she is hyper-visible, and because of this her life and legacy are subject to being called fake or conspiracy by some on certain social media sites. Working and exploring conditions of visibility and how they manifest, both for the individual and how they are perceived, is a core foundation of my work. When almost one in five people are disabled, it is vital that we ensure that disabled lives historically are made visible, and through ensuring well-rounded depictions of these historical figures amongst the general public. Perhaps we can challenge the ableism that is fueling the misinformation of these so-called history-inspired TikToks. Do you think you could be a teacher? Look at these adverts. Think of the children wrapped with attention. Look at the superhero teacher, especially now in the pandemic, we need those heroes teaching. These adverts are designed to appeal to people like you. People who may be thinking of changing careers, people with real skills to offer. The government really wants people like you to join the profession. When surveyed, over 50% of people thought they'd be really good teachers. So why is there this huge disconnect between people who think they'd be really good at teaching and people who actually make a career in the profession? Ten years ago, I was one of those people. I used to be a music and film journalist, but I also used to study part time and that led me back to Swansea University. Here at Swansea, I started working with Reaching Wider. Reaching Wider is a fantastic programme that goes out into schools, trying to inspire secondary, ch secondary school children who wouldn't normally stay in education to continue showing the opportunities that are out there for them. That made me want to be a teacher. But of the 28 people who are in my science PGCE class, only five are now teaching. Many of them didn't even survive the first year and they're not alone. Looking at this graph you can see that since 2011 teachers are leaving the profession faster than ever in those first five years and at the same time we've got the number of secondary school children rising faster than ever. We've got a rising population in our schools so we need more teachers. 
So I am now a PGC lecturer at chemistry, in chemistry at Swansea University. So more than ever, I want to know what makes people stay and what makes people leave. What I'm doing is surveying recruits from 2020 onwards every year to find out what are their challenges in the profession. I'm starting here at Swansea and then going to other institutions in Wales, getting a feel for what are the challenges that are facing these people in training. The Wales curriculum is changing. From 2020 to 2022, there's going to be a new Donaldson curriculum. It's a skills-based curriculum. So more than ever, we need those, you know, the kind of teachers that have more skills than before, that can offer a multifaceted take on the world. So we need those teachers to stay. So it's more important than ever that we find out what challenges there are, how we can recruit and how we can retain those teachers because good teachers really do make a difference. Hello, I'm Ibrahim. I'm an engineering research student sponsored by a major steel manufacturing company to research how best to look after a material they use in their process. This material is a ceramic. Now, if you're watching in the UK, you, or at least someone you know, drinks a cup of tea every now and again. Well, most tea mugs are made up of ceramics. Ceramics are known to be good at handling high temperatures. And that's why we use them, because they keep our tea nice and warm. Now, back to the steel making process. To make steel, you need to mix iron and other elements together. But firstly, you need to actually melt them at high, high, high temperatures. You also need a container. Well, the container of choice to contain this high, high temperature mixture is, guess what? It's actually a ceramic container. You've guessed it. Now, ceramics aren't perfect, otherwise I'd have no research. Ceramics need to be handled carefully. If heated too fast or it's suddenly exposed to a high temperature, they can break. And this type of break is called a thermal shock failure. So ceramics need to be gradually or slowly heated. Now, why is this an issue? Well, if a ceramic container containing this high temperature mixture breaks, it can be number one, unsafe and dangerous for the people that work close to it. Number two, it can actually be costly for our sponsor. And that's why I'm researching in, in also two ways how best to look after this material. Number one, by looking at what temperature that we should heat this material to and how fast we should heat the ceramic. Number two actually takes us to the point or back to the point where this ceramic container was made. Carbon was actually added to it to make it more, let's just say resilient to thermal shock. But let's just say there's good carbons and bad carbons. And at high temperatures, these carbons can react with the atmosphere around us and then make the ceramic even more prone or weaker. And this makes it more prone to thermal, thermal shock failure. So my other area of focus is looking at identifying these type of carbons, the different type of carbons, and looking at the good carbons that are helping the material and the bad ones which are reacting with the atmosphere around us. I hope that my research will, number one, again, save the company in terms of cost and also, number two, keep the people that work close to this material safe as well. Thank you for listening. People living with chronic lung conditions such as COPD, bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis make up 1.5 million people in the UK, with a significant proportion of them suffering with excessive sputum. Sputum that builds up in your airways can cause a number of symptoms, including breathlessness, increased risk of infection and cough. Having a persistent and embarrassing cough can have a significant effect on your work, social and personal life. And I think that after 2020, we can all appreciate a little bit more how having a persistent cough in a public place can make you feel. There are many ways to clear your chest. Most are difficult, unpleasant and energetic. So with this in mind, it's important that as healthcare professionals, we're able to recommend the most effective and well-evidenced methods. My research aims to evaluate one of the many methods available and add to the body of knowledge and inform collaborative healthcare conversations. Oscillatory positive expiratory pressure, the long name, or OPEP as it's more commonly known, are devices that rattle the air in your airways, making it easier for you to clear your chest. 
better for your sputum to be out than in. So with this in mind, I'm taking a two pronged approach in order to gather evidence. People with COPD make up the largest number amongst this condi these conditions. With the NICE guidelines recommending two possible treatments for excessive sputum. And this has come from a large amount of historical data and years of clinical practice. However, there is a lack of robust data from clinical trials comparing OPEP to breathing exercises. My research aims to design a randomised control trial to compare OPEP to breathing exercises with outcomes that are meaningful to people suffering with these conditions. I hope to be able to answer questions like, am I less likely to cough or need to go to the GP if I use an OPEP device? Am I less likely to need to be admitted to hospital with a chest infection if I clear my chest regularly? Is using an OPEP device easy and effective? Also, I'm aiming to gather the opinions and experiences of people living with these conditions to build a picture of how people feel and deal with clearing their chests regularly and using an OPEP device. I hope that this will bring the stories of people suffering with excessive sputum to life and act as a guide to inform solutions through focused research questions, improving in a meaningful way the way that we prescribe and teach the use of OPEP devices. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. I'm going to tell you a story. A story about the power of reading and what happens when parents or carers and their children share books together. Were you read to as a child? Did you enjoy it? Did you have books in your home? If you're at university then you're likely to answer yes to those questions because how often children are read to before they start school, their enjoyment of reading and the number of books in a child's home correlate strongly with educational attainment. The singer Dolly Parton dreamt of changing lives when she started the Imagination Library, a charity which gives a book a month for the first five years of life to more than one million children worldwide. My research is going to help the Dollywood Foundation to change more lives by understanding what motivates parents to read with their babies and young children, and what is the impact of receiving books as gifts. To use Dolly's words, why would parents, after a hard day working nine to five, spend time reading to little Jolene? The answers to these questions will help to ensure that more children have access to those early reading experiences that we know are linked to future success. Lots of research looks at the outcome of early shared reading, mostly focused on language and literacy skills. But my research aims to find out what families think and feel about reading with their children. As well as looking at data on children's school test scores, I created surveys for parents and over 5,000 families responded, showing just how important parents think this topic is. I found that although Imagination Library families were less likely to have parents who were educated to degree level, a factor strongly linked to frequent reading, they were statistically more likely to read daily with their child, particularly in the first year of life, than other families. And families who didn't receive the Imagination Library books were nearly three times more likely not to read with their child at all. Understanding what motivates parents to start reading will help support families where this doesn't yet happen. In my research, I'm trying to understand what's important to families when they read with their child. And in this work, one word comes up more than any other. It's not about helping their child to be clever or ready for school, though early shared reading does have a positive impact on these things. The word parents used more than any other when talking about reading with their child was bonding. Parents talked about bonding or time spent with their child more than twice as often as they talked about the learning or language benefits of reading. Parents like to snuggle up with their child in a good book, and these behaviours build enjoyment of reading in their children. By better understanding what's important to parents, charities, educators and policy makers will be able to better support more families to read with their children. And that's how my research will help families across the UK to live happily ever after. Movement, touch, sight, speech 
understanding and happiness. These are some of the most important human qualities when it comes to experiencing the world around us. So imagine if you were to have one, if not all of these taken away from you. Loss like this will be experienced at one point or another by sufferers of multiple sclerosis or MS. This is a disease whereby our own immune system, the very thing that's supposed to defend our body, decides to attack our brain. MS can affect anywhere in the brain, including the spinal cord, causing massive amounts of damage. However, there are a lot of variabilities in what determine the degree of suffering in MS. For example, the area that's affected. Some patients may experience a more affected spinal cord, leading to limb dysfunction. Some can experience damage in parts of the brain responsible for vision. Others may experience damage in parts of the brain that don't even result in any noticeable symptoms at first. The reason why MS can affect the entirety of the brain, including the spinal cord, is because the thing that our immune system decides to destroy is present throughout these structures. It's called myelin. It's the protective layer on our most prevalent brain cell, the neuron. It acts in the same way that a plastic coating does to a wire. If you remove that plastic coating, then the wire can become exposed to the surrounding elements causing damage, but also signals that are traveling through that wire can pass to other nearby wires causing more dysfunction. This also leads the neuron to die, which means patients only get worse and do not recover. Currently, there is limited knowledge on what causes our immune system to betray our brain like this. It could be environmental or genetic, but it's most likely a combination of both. That's where people like me come in. I'm a pathologist, or in other words, a crime scene investigator of the microscopic world. I look at the end point of a crime scene and try to look for clues and footprints that I can piece together to form a narrative of what happened. I do this by looking at post-mortem brain tissue of people who have unfortunately passed away with MS. However, this approach is limited if not paired with other disciplines. That's why I'm not only looking at the traditional detective approach, but I'm also using the latest technology to look at the genetics of the disease in collaboration with Imperial College London. By looking at the different representations of the disease across the largest cohort of digital postmortem MS tissue ever assembled, I hope that we can uncover specific genetic explanations for the types of damage which we see in MS. For example, a specific genetic mutation that results in increased myelin or neuron loss in the spinal cord. It's hoped that this project will improve our understanding of MS so that we can offer new, more personalized treatments to preserve these vital brain functions of those affected by this debilitating disease. So here we are on the other side. I hope you enjoyed the presentations. So we now have the honor to announce the winner and the three runners up. It's my great pleasure to announce that the winner of Swansea University 3MT competition 2021 is Kristen Hawkins from the medical school with a presentation called Brain Wars. Uh, Kristen is doing a PhD in neuroscience and as winner will go on to represent Swansea at the Vite UK quarterfinal of 3MT later this year. Congratulations, Kristen, and we wish you the best of luck with the next stage. Followed closely are three runners up and they are in no particular order. Uh, Kirsty Hill from Human Health Sciences with a presentation, Are We Losing Sight of Sight Loss? Larissa Nicholas from the College of Science with a presentation on biological waste in developing nations. And Benjamin Coos from the medical school on understanding multiple sclerosis. Congratulations to you as well. Uh, and in fact, of course, a big thank you to uh, all finalists and in fact, all participants uh, the presentations and research insights provided by you are fascinating and offer a glimpse of the research our postgraduate community is working on here at Toronto University. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about you and your research in the future.